The Federalist. The Federalist was a newspaper series published under the under the pseudonym Publius. It appeared uh, first in two New York City newspapers in 77 numbers, and eventually the final eight of the 85 essays appeared in the second volume of the two-volume hardback book edition that was published in 1788. Some of the essays were later reprinted in other states, but there was no other state in which all of the essays appeared than New York. The Federalist Project was organized by New York City uh, resident Alexander Hamilton, a prominent 1780s political figure. Hamilton had been involved in calling for a federal uh, convention to amend or replace the Articles of Confederation since the very earliest 1780s. He had been a delegate to the Annapolis Convention of summer of 1786 and was one of the people most responsible for that convention's call on Congress uh, and on the states to convene a second convention in Philadelphia in summer of 1787 for the purpose of am amending the Articles of Confederation. Hamilton attended the Philadelphia Convention briefly. Um, basically what happened was that he was part of a three-man delegation from New York. The governor of New York and other reigning powers that be in New York had seen to it that the convention delegation from New York was controlled by people who were opposed to any substantial change in the federal form of government. And two of the three delegates, the ones other than Hamilton, left the convention after only a few weeks, saying that they had not been sent to Philadelphia to construct an entirely new government, but only to propose amendments to the Articles of Confederation. Hamilton then himself played a pretty uh, insubstantial role in the Philadelphia Convention, but was seriously concerned to have the uh, Philadelphia Convention's product, the proposed U.S. Constitution, ratified by the 13 states. So he went back to New York um, and worked to organize this series. He asked his friend, Governor Morris, who had also been a delegate to the Philadelphia Convention, whether he would contribute essays to the series he had in mind, and Morris said no, that he didn't write for popular newspapers. Uh, Hamilton then recruited another New York congressman to contribute, but that fellow's three draft essays struck Hamilton as not substantial enough, and so uh, ultimately he asked his friend and acquaintance, perhaps New York's most prominent politician after the governor, John Jay, whether he would do it, and Jay said yes. Uh, and besides him, it was convenient for Hamilton that the Confederation Congress was meeting in New York City because that meant that Virginia Congressman James Madison was able to join in. Ultimately, Jay became ill during the publication of the series, and so the bulk of the work fell on the shoulders of, of Hamilton and his uh, sometime congressional colleague, James Madison. The series' influence has been greatly exaggerated from the very earliest part of the 19th century. A leading constitutional commentator, um, Joseph Story, had very high uh, praise for it and for its significance in history, and John Marshall referred to it and relied on it in writing opinions for the Supreme Court, but this was a distortion of history, and we see the same tendency today when people who want to find the original understanding are prone to pull a copy of Publius uh, Federalist down off the shelves and turn to the index for the topic that they are looking for. Another uh, example of the high praise that's heaped upon it today and the exaggerated influence that's uh, ascribed to it is uh, the University of Texas Law School professor, my former professor, uh, Sanford Levinson, saying in a recent book that the, the Federalist was, quote, the official version, unquote, of the Constitution, and nothing can be further from the truth, as I've just explained. Besides that, I, I said that the series' influence on the ratification process had been exaggerated. In fact, by the time the last of the essays were first printed, eight states had already ratified the Constitution. So clearly, those essays didn't affect the process in those eight states. Only in New York were they all published, and even there, uh, 
they certainly weren't responsible for the fact that the state ultimately ratified. In fact, the way the Poughkeepsie Convention worked was that when they had their elections for a ratification convention in New York State, about two-thirds of the delegates who were elected were pledged to vote no. And ultimately, the reasons why New York ended up ratifying the Constitution came down to that while the Poughkeepsie Convention was proceeding, New York and New Hampshire I'm sorry, Virginia and New Hampshire became the ninth and tenth states to ratify, and uh, Federalists from New York City let the rumor spread that in case New York State didn't ratify, New York City would secede from New York State and join the Union as a free city. So with that in mind, the, the convention majority basically held its nose and agreed to this Constitution by the narrow vote of 30 to 27. In other words, as I said, New York City, New York State were not persuaded by Publius. What can we get out of the Federalists then? What's the point of all the attention people paid to it? Well, for one thing, it does show us for what arguments are being made by Federalists in New York. Now, these weren't the only arguments that were made by Federalists in New York, and we certainly need to pull out the five volumes of the documentary history of the ratification of the Constitution for New York for full elucidation of the New York Federalist argument, but this is a good starting point for that. And we also get a little bit of insight into the thinking of three um, very important figures in uh, revolutionary and early Republican politics, the two notable Federalists from New York, Hamilton and Jay, and besides them, James Madison, the foremost proponent of the Constitution. All of them um, contributed notable essays. In fact, the, the level of discussion in the Federalist series is really hard to hard to top. It's it's amazing to imagine that there was a time when New York and American newspapers featured these top of the line essays in political philosophy. There's certainly nothing like that in American newspapers now. Um, of course, we're also to bear in mind the fact that the the Publius series was a kind of lawyer's brief. It was not going to say what was objectionable about the Constitution in any great length or with any great uh, vehemence. And in fact, there are in instances in which it's obvious that the uh, authors aren't being candid. So take, for example, uh, James Madison's number 62 and 63 defending the structure of the federal Senate. Madison had devoted a lot of time and effort in the Philadelphia Convention in the summer of 1787 to persuading his fellow delegates not to have the Senate be structured as it finally was with each state having two votes regardless of population uh, in particular and and yet um, he didn't get what he wanted and so here he is in the Federalist defending it. Why is he defending it? Well because his goal is to have the Constitution ratified. There are some key themes that run through the Federalist series. These are also key themes in the Federalist effort throughout the country generally. First of all, the Articles of Confederation were inadequate. That's what the Federalists said. Now, there can be discussion and debate about that. In fact, um, there were powerful counter-arguments made by anti-Federalists at the time, but this certainly was the general feeling of much of America's political elite that there needed to be a more substantial central government, and Publius comes back to that idea over and over again through the 85 essays. It doesn't matter which of the three authors we're talking about. Secondly, Publius, that is Hamilton, Madison, and Jay writing under the pen name Publius, um, say the anti-federalists are offering no alternative. There is a kind of classic um, slogan in American politics, you can't beat something with nothing. That is, if there's a problem and one side is proposing a, a, an approach to solving it, you can't usually beat it by saying, well, nothing, or we don't like your idea. So um, Federalists over and over again highlighted the fact that the Anti-Federalists didn't have a counter-proposal. Thirdly, the Federalist series repeatedly falls back on the idea, and this is one that had been worked out by James Madison in nearly a year of research into the history of republics, ancient and modern, leading up to the Philadelphia Convention, that federations, and of course the Articles of Confederation created a federation, federations through history, whether among the ancient Greeks or in modern times, uh, had failed typically because of lack of power in the center. So ultimately, they, t they tended to dissolve because uh, 
the center wasn't powerful enough. Now, of course, there are other ways to explain this phenomenon or to describe it, but that was the way the Federalists put it. They also said that they did agree that the Constitution was imperfect, but they thought it was generally a good one, and kind of echoing what Ben Franklin had said at the end of the Philadelphia Convention, and they weren't persuaded that there was any way to get a better one out of a meeting of people from different states with different interests. Um, so there were going to be compromises anytime you wanted to have a federal government. And the Constitution was a good compromise. It was a good product. It wasn't ideal. You wouldn't have dreamt it up, but it was a good product. Some of the anti-federalists were saying, well, one way we could improve on this would be to have a second federal convention. And Publius addresses this in numerous essays and, and his that is, the, the three of them together under this pen name, Publius, their position is that a second convention is unlikely to yield a better solution to the federal problem than the U.S. Constitution. And finally, sprinkled through the series are allegations that their opponents have bad motives. This, it seems to me, is, is rather the least, um, shall we say, praiseworthy of the arguments that, <clears throat> that Publius makes. There's not a lot of evidence for what they say about uh, the supposed selfishness behind key figures like the governor of New York and the, the former governor of Virginia and so on, opposing ratification of the unamended constitution. But they come back to that over and over, and even then people tend to be suspicious of politicians, so it's uh, likely one supposes that people would have been uh, swayed by the argument that, well, our opponents have bad motives, they're selfish. I'm going to talk a bit about three of the chief numbers in the Federalist series. So historians, scholars, judges tend to refer to the Federalist essays by, by number. For example, Federalist number one. Federalist number one was written by Hamilton. It's an introduction to the series. He tells what's going to happen through the rest of the series and what kinds of uh, major uh, themes the series will revert to over and over again. But the thing that Federalist Number 1 is most famous for is Hamilton's uh, description of the choice that favors Americans as the series kicks off in 1787. He says, Americans have a unique opportunity to answer the question whether it's possible for man to be governed by what he calls, quote, reflection and choice or whether man must always be governed by, quote, accident and force. Accident and force, of course, is a reference to government by kings, dukes, uh, bishops, sultans, tsars, uh, awa, array, um, somebody who's inherited the position or somebody who has it because he's some kind of warlord. And here the Americans, on the other hand, are having meetings, having discussions, having elections, now having this ratification debate all of which uh, he hopes will vindicate the Republican experiment, which Publius says is threatened by the uh, looming breakdown of the Confederation. The second um, of the Federalist essays worthy of extended note, and the, one, the first one I'm going to pay a lot of attention to, is Federalist Number 10. Federalist Number 10 is likely the most famous essay in American political science. It was written by Madison, and the subject there is what Madison calls faction. Madison says that faction, as he defines it, is the characteristic or besetting problem of, Republican, of the Republican form. So when you have Republican government, this is the problem you get. He says uh, a faction is any group, it could be a majority or it could be a minority, that has come together to seek its own interest instead of the common interest. So notice he assumes here that there is such a thing as a common interest. There is a public good, and the task of a statesman is to identify it. But a factious person will be seeking merely his own selfish uh, reward or his own selfish interest instead of the common good. So there are two kinds of factions, according to Madison, the majority faction and the minority faction. The minority faction is easily dealt with, he thinks, in a Republican government, and that is done by simply voting against the minority faction. Where you have a minority faction, they're not going to be able to win elections. If once you've identified the minority as factious, you can vote them down. The more difficult problem is majority faction. 
What do you do if you have a majority of people who have decided they're going to vote for their own interest instead of the common interest? Madison says, well, you can't actually solve that problem in a Republican society. You can't get rid of it altogether. The only way that you'd be able to do that would be by outlawing freedom of the press and by uh, getting rid of elections. So you don't want to get rid of the threat of majority faction altogether. On the other hand, Madison says that by extending what he calls, quote, extending the sphere of Republican government, you can make less likely that factions will dominate. You can make less likely that there will be a majority that sets up his own, its own interest instead of the common interest and, and runs the government over a long period of time. Now, what does he mean by extending the sphere? Well, what he means is instead of having a government over Rhode Island or Delaware or Georgia, you should take in the whole area from New Hampshire to Georgia. And by doing that, you'll bring into society um, a multiplicity of economic interests, social interests, religious subscriptions, factions run by particular um, uh, charismatic leaders, and so a group, uh, religious persuasion and ethnicity, uh, a charismatic leader who might be able to run a society in a small area won't be able to over a large area or be less likely to be able to organize themselves into a majority faction over a large area. Now, Madison is not promising that faction can't happen. He says uh, that it possibly will, but what he's hoping to do here is to make it far less likely by extending the sphere of Republican government. And so, of course, in that day and age when you, communications were far more difficult, travel was far more difficult. Georgia and New Hampshire really were a very, very long way apart. Um, this seemed to him to be a plausible answer to the problem that had grown up, uh, he thought, during the 1770s and 80s, in, during which period several states had uh, been dominated by charismatic figures. He was obviously thinking of people like Patrick Henry and New York's Governor George Clinton. But um, Madison also here is dealing with an objection that anti-federalists have been making to the Constitution. The Constitution would have set up a Republican government over this large area. And you have a classic essay in political science by the Baron de Montesquieu. Uh, actually, it's part of his book, De l'Esprit des Lois, The Spirit of the Laws, that said because that the history of Roman society showed that you could only keep uh, Republican government over a large period, a long period of time, over a large over a small area, that if you had a large area, the republic would break down. So Madison's having to deal with that. And the way he answers it here, as I've said, is by showing that in his estimation, Montesquieu had it exactly wrong. The only way you could avoid faction and have a real republic over a long period of time, he thought, was to have a big area with a big population with a multiplicity of religions and ethnicities and so on. So it's, uh, it's counterintuitive for people in the uh, late 18th century, but it's been taken as a very brilliant essay. The second of the Federalist essays I want to devote some attention to is Federalist number 51. This one, again, is written by Madison. And this time the subject is what he calls checks and balances. When I say he calls it that, actually this phrase is in common parlance in America, and it comes from Madison's Federalist 51. But Madison didn't invent the idea of checks and balances, uh, which it was thought already existed in the British system, in which it had existed, it was thought in the ancient Roman system, at least, and uh, arguably in several other governments too. But uh, this idea comes from Montesquieu as well. So we saw before in number 51 that Madison was having to disprove or provide an answer to a claim based on Montesquieu, and here he's borrowing from Montesquieu. The idea that Madison is dealing with in Federalist 51 came from anti-Federalist critics. So we should note that the Federalist series is not just a bunch of philosophers sitting in a room writing about ideal government. One thing they're doing is they're answering, even as they're laying out a positive argument for the, the federal constitution, they're also answering new claims that are being made by their opponents. In number 51, Madison is answering the anti-Federalist claim that this is just too much government power. We can't have freedom over a long period of time if we have this much power concentrated in a few. So he explains in number 51 how checks and balances will work, that the president in theory won't be able to spend money without getting Congress to appropriate it, the Senate can't legislate without cooperation of the House, that um, 
judges can't be appointed without cooperation between the president and the Senate and so on. And so uh, whatever major act is going to be taken will involve the cooperation of at least two of these institutions. And well, this of course assumes that the president will actually have to get Congress's approval before he goes out and makes war, which is not evidence or one example of the way that the system has tended to degenerate over time, as Madison expected and as people in the late 18th century thought all government was prone to do. But the point is that this, this contrivance, checks and balances, was supposed to make it safer to delegate a lot of authority to a distant central government that you'd never really heard of before. It was brand new. And here we are, are four or five years since the revolution. We're already turning around, creating a new unknown government and giving it a lot of power. Madison says, well, you can, you can take some solace in the fact that we're going to have this important principle of checks and balances run through the system. Madison gives us in number 51 a classic statement of what is going on in creating the new government. He says, quote, ambition must be made to counteract ambition. The interest of the man must be connected with the constitutional rights of the place. It may be a reflection on human nature that such devices should be necessary con to control the abuses of government. But what is government itself but the greatest of all reflections on human nature? If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. So this is one of the few instances in which Madison gave us a, a pithy kind of statement of his position. Madison was prone to come up with brilliant answers to political problems, but unlike his best friend Thomas Jefferson, he didn't just dash off memorable uh, epigrams all the time. He wasn't, he wasn't um, the kind of fellow who um, thought in catchy phrases, but here this idea of letting ambition counteract ambition summarizes the idea of checks and balances, and really the idea uh, the Madisonian scheme of, of uh, representative uh, Republican government very well. The third and final Federalist essay I'm going to discuss in some um, detail is number 78 by Alexander Hamilton. And this is on a characteristically Hamiltonian element of the Constitution, Article 3, which describes the judiciary. Now, again, what's been going on here is that in New York, people have been criticizing the Constitution, and one basis on which they've done that is that they've said that the judiciary article, number 3, is uh, unrepublican. That there's contemplation of letting the judges exercise the power of judicial review, that the judges aren't going to be accountable to anyone, they're never going to have been elected, and they're not going to be susceptible to recall or have to stand for re-election. And so Hamilton answers these objections in number 78. First of all, when it comes to good behavior tenure, he concedes that it might seem unrepublican. But then he notes that, well, you wouldn't want judges chosen any other way. You wouldn't want them um, susceptible to removal by the executive, as had been the case in England before the, uh, before the Glorious Revolution, because you, you would have the king being able to tell the judges what to do, and that's not going to be conducive to the kind of free, fair um, trial that a criminal defendant has a right to expect. And beside that, uh, it's a difficult science law, and so it's not everybody who's going to be able to say which people are actually qualified to hold these positions. The more significant of the elements of Federalist Number 78, however, is Hamilton's explanation and justification of judicial review. As Americans in the early 21st century, we take the idea of judicial review for granted, but it was really a novelty in revolutionary America. By the time the federal constitution was before the people of New York for ratification, the power of judicial review had only been exercised three or four times in the whole world's history, and that had been in the history of the American states since independence. So um, it needed justification. People were saying it's inappropriate. And a federalist said that this power of judicial review put the the judiciary above the legislature. And what kind of Republican government has the judiciary, again, unappointed and unaccountable as the Supreme Branch? So Hamilton denied that that's what was going on when a federal judge said 
that he was not going to give effect to a statute because it was unconstitutional. Rather, Hamilton said, what he's doing is saying that I am it, I am not above the legislature, but the, the Constitution is above us both. So this is the classic argument for judicial review even now, and it's cited by American and foreign courts on a regular basis. Other notable arguments in the Federalist series include, as I mentioned before, number 62 and 3, where Madison is defending the Senate, despite the fact that he didn't like the Senate, and number 85, where Hamilton persists in the argument that people had made in the Philadelphia Convention in saying that there should not be a Bill of Rights. Okay, This was, again, a powerful, powerful argument that anti-federalists were making against ratifying the Constitution without amending it first. There needed, they said, to be a Bill of Rights. And Hamilton made two answers to that. Number one was, he said, uh, you know, paper check, what good is it? Number two was, he said, it would be dangerous because if you include a Bill of Rights, that can be read as an exclusive list, and then the legislature would feel entitled to violate other of our rights. And it's impossible to list all of our rights, so whatever list you have is going to amount to a, a statement that, well, these are the only rights that you need to respect. And so for both of these reasons, he said, the, the Constitution should not have a Bill of Rights. What effect did the Federalists have? Well, the effect was little at the time, very slight influence on the ratification process, but it was it has been increasingly great, as John Marshall used it in Marbury versus Madison and McCulloch versus Maryland, two of the most important decisions in the history of American law. Uh, he basically relied on arguments that have been made by Hamilton. Um, and people commonly rely on the Federalists now to give them elucidation of the understanding of the Constitution that was held by the people who uh, wrote it and ratified it. I explained earlier in this discussion why I think that's an inappropriate reliance, but it certainly is an important one. And anybody who wants to understand what's happened to the Constitution since it was ratified definitely needs to be familiar with the Federalists.